In this video, we will be talking about rational functions. Example 1 says sketch a graph of the function y equals 1 over x. Sometimes you'll also hear this called the reciprocal function. because we're taking our input and we are taking the reciprocal of it. So whenever we don't know what the graph of something looks like, we can make an input output table. Plugging in a number like one makes things easy because the reciprocal of one is one. If I were to plug in two, my output value would be one half. If I were to plug in 10, my output value would be one tenth. What about numbers like one tenth? If I were to plug that in, then my output would be 10. So when my x values are positive, my graph is going to be contained in the first quadrant, quadrant 1 here. So I know that 1 comma 1 is an ordered pair, 2 comma 1 half, 10 comma 1 tenth is not on here. And if I plug in 1 tenth, that's going to be quite high up. If I plug in something like 1 fourth, then my output would be 4. So that's about here. And if we connect these values, it's going to look something like this. And I'm going to put arrows at the end to indicate that they are going on forever in both directions. And let's continue with our table. Notice that if I plugged in 0, my output would be undefined since we would have 1 divided by 0 and that is undefined. If I plugged in negative 1, my output would be negative 1, so I'll put a ordered pair at negative 1 comma negative 1. If I plugged in negative 1 half, my output would be negative 2. So that's right here. If I plugged in negative 2, my output would be negative 1 half. That's about here. And it turns out it's going to look very similar to what we had in quadrant 1. It's just going to kind of be mirrored in quadrant 3. And it's going to look something like that. So here is quadrant 3. Here we have quadrant 2, here we have quadrant 4. So this particular graph does not really exist in quadrant 2 or 4, and it's limited to quadrants 1 and 3. So here's what the graph looks like. Let's define what a rational function is. A rational function is of the form r of x equals p of x over q of x, where p of x and q of x are polynomials, and q of x is not equal to 0. So this function, the reciprocal function that we were looking at, is in fact a rational function because we have a polynomial divided by a polynomial. So even though 1 doesn't have any variables in it, it is a polynomial because it's a constant function. And then in the bottom, we have a linear function, which is falls under the category of polynomials. So let's talk about asymptotes now. The line x equals a is a vertical asymptote of the function y equals f of x if f of x approaches infinity or negative infinity as x approaches a from the right or the left. So coming back to this graph that we had, it turns out that we have a vertical asymptote here on the line x equals 0, which also happens to be the y-axis. And this is a vertical asymptote because our function as x approaches 0 from the right-hand side is going off to infinity, which is one of the possible options. And as we approach the y-axis from the left-hand side, we are approaching negative infinity, which is also one of the options. So because we have that to be true, that means that we have a vertical asymptote at the line x equals 0, which is also the y-axis. Now, the line y equals b is a horizontal asymptote of the function y equals f of x if f of x approaches b as x approaches infinity or negative infinity. And this one we have previously referred to as end behavior, but that's when we are talking about the end behavior of polynomials. The end behavior of rational functions is a little bit different, and so what we can see is that as x approaches infinity, the y value is getting closer and closer and closer to zero. And same thing as x approaches negative infinity, the y value is also approaching zero because 
if I have the function y equals 1 over x. If I plug in really large numbers for x, if I plug in a million or a billion, these the output values get really, really small. Since our numerator is 1, it's a constant, and it's not changing, and our denominator is getting really, really big. So as x goes to infinity, y approaches 0. And same thing as x approaches negative infinity, y also approaches 0. And so what that implies here is that at y equals 0, which also happens to be the x-axis, we have a horizontal asymptote. So something that students will often struggle with a little bit when they first start learning about asymptotes is that asymptotes are lines. So when you are presenting them, they need to pre be presented in the form of an equation that represents a line. So let's do that for example one. Okay, so our vertical asymptote here is the line x equals zero, and the horizontal asymptote is the line y equals zero. So you don't want to just put a number, we need an equation, and vertical line equations are always of the form x equals, and then horizontal lines, those equations are of the form y equals, and then some number. Also, moving forward, you will see me abbreviate, because I don't want to write out vertical asymptote every time, you'll see me abbreviate vertical asymptote to VA, and horizontal asymptote, you'll see me abbreviate it to HA. So the VA here is x equals 0, and the HA is y equals 0. Example 2 says consider the function f of x equals negative 1 over x minus 1. Identify any asymptotes, describe the end behavior, then sketch a graph of the function. So earlier we graphed y equals 1 over x, and we could think about this as the parent graph, and we can think about this as the child graph. And so we want to think about what transformations are happening to the parent graph for us to end up at the child graph. So there's two transformations that are happening. Can you recognize what they are? All right, so the negative sign in front of the function, this indicates that we are going to reflect the graph over the x-axis. And then by subtracting 1 here from the input value, what that does is that has us shifting right one unit. Okay, so if we're taking our parent graph y equals 1 over x and we are reflecting it over the x-axis, that is not going to change where our asymptotes are located. It's just going to take our graph, which was originally in quadrant 1 and quadrant 3, and that's now going to change them to be in quadrant 2 and quadrant 4. So I'm going to go ahead and erase this. And then the second thing is that we're shifting our entire graph right one unit. And so if we were to do that, originally our vertical asymptote was at x equals 0, which is also the y-axis. But now our vertical asymptote is going to be because we're shifting right one unit, now it's going to be at the line x equals 1. And you'll notice that the way that I draw asymptotes is by putting dashed lines, because asymptotes are actually not part of the graph or the solution set. So they're not included, which is why we put them as dashed lines to give us kind of a skeleton for how we should be drawing our graphs. So this is our vertical asymptote. And the horizontal asymptote has stayed in its position, which is the x-axis, or in other words, the line y equals 0. So now I'm going to go ahead and draw my graph. Remember, it reflected over the x-axis, so it's going to look something like this. And then it's also going to look something like that. And 
Notice that I can actually solve for my y-intercept here. I can plug in 0 into my function, and this would become negative 1 over negative 1, which becomes 1. So then that means that our y-intercept is 0, 1, and I can kind of highlight that here, 0, 1. So there's the graph, and we want to identify any asymptotes and describe the end behavior. So our vertical asymptote is the vertical line x equals 1. Our horizontal asymptote is the line y equals 0. And our end behavior is as x approaches infinity, f of x approaches 0. And as x approaches negative infinity, f of x also approaches 0. So that concludes this example. Example 3 says graph the function s of x is equal to 2x minus 9 all over x minus 4. What are the domain and range of s of x? Now, looking at this function, we can tell that it's a rational function because we have a linear function divided by a linear function or a polynomial divided by a polynomial. However, it's kind of hard to see what kind of transformations are happening to this graph from the parent graph y equals 1 over x. So one way that we could get it into a form where it's going to be more apparent what the transformations are is by using long division. So I'm going to have x minus 4 on the outside, and on the outside I'm going to have 2x minus 9. So if I ask myself, how many times does x go into 2x? That's 2. And then that's going to give me 2x. And then negative 4 times 2 is negative 8. And now we have negative 9 minus negative 8. That's negative 1. So previously, when we've learned the division algorithm, we can rewrite this in form 1 of the division algorithm, and that tells us that 2x minus 9 over x minus 4 is equal to 2, and then our remainder is 1 over x minus 4. So remember from the division algorithm, this thing is called our quotient, this is our remainder, x minus 4 in both of these spots is called the divisor, and 2x minus 9, which was our original numerator, is called the dividend. Okay, so we were able to rewrite our function in a form where it's easier to see what transformations are happening. So I rearrange the terms so that we have s of x is equal to negative 1 over x minus 4 plus 2. Take a moment, pause the video, and see if you can figure out what transformations are happening here. Alright, so here are the three transformations that are happening. We have a reflection over the x-axis, we have a shift right 4 units, and we have a shift up 2 units. So. Notice that reflections don't affect our asymptotes from the parent graph y equals 1 over x, but we do have a shift right 4 units and a shift up 2 units. Both of these shifts are going to change where our asymptotes are at. So if we're shifting right 4 units, that means that we will have our vertical asymptote, which originally was the y-axis. Now our vertical asymptote will be located at x equals 4. And then we're shifting up two units, so our new horizontal asymptote will be here at y equals 2. So now with these blue dashed lines, you can almost kind of think of those as our new x and y axis, so that we can talk about our original parent graph, y equals 1 over x, would have its portions of its graph in quadrant 1 and quadrant 3, but because we're reflecting over the x-axis, now it's going to be in quadrant 3 and quadrant 1, again, it, assuming that we're having the blue lines think about, like, thought of as our new x and y-axis. And another thing is, 
When you're dealing with a rational function, the way that you find the x-intercepts is by setting the numerator equal to 0. So if I took my numerator 2x minus 9 and I set that equal to 0, if I solve for x, we would get x equals 9 over 2 or x equals 4.5. So that tells me that my graph is going to cross the x-axis x -axis at 4.5 comma 0. So that's going to be about right there and it's going to look something like that. My graph over here, I think I didn't put it close enough. So maybe something more like that. And there is our graph here. Now let's go ahead and talk about the domain and range. So the domain of this function, notice that I can plug in any x value into this because it's a rational function except for the x values that are going to make the denominator 0. So what I can do is I can set my denominator equal to 0 and solve and we get x equals 4. And notice that there is a vertical asymptote when x equals 4. So that's telling us that our domain is going to be anything except the value of positive 4. So here is our domain. Now let's go ahead and talk about the range. So from the graph, we can see that our function graph gets really close to the horizontal asymptote. It almost hugs it because it's kind of like our end behavior. But in this particular example, our graph is not going to cross our horizontal asymptote. So that tells us that our range is going to be everything except for the y value 2. So our range is going to be everything except for positive 2. And I just want to reiterate from earlier that our vertical asymptote is the line x equals 4, and our horizontal asymptote is the line y equals 2. So here's a more systematic way of how to find asymptotes of rational functions. Let r of x equal p of x over q of x be a rational function. The vertical asymptotes occur at x equals a, where a is a 0 of q of x, and as a reminder, q of x is the denominator. So the way that you can find vertical asymptotes is by taking your denominator and setting it equal to 0 and solving what input values make the denominator 0. It works kind of differently for horizontal asymptotes. There are three cases. The first case is if the degree of the numerator is greater than the degree of the denominator. If that's the case, then there is no horizontal asymptote. If the degree of the numerator is less than the degree of the denominator, then the horizontal asymptote is the line y equals 0. And our third case is if the degree of the numerator and the denominator are equal to each other, then the horizontal asymptote is equal to or is y equals the leading coefficient of the numerator divided by the leading coefficient of the denominator. So actually in this case, notice that this is a linear function in the numerator, this is a linear function in the denominator. So our horizontal asymptote, we could think about it as y equals the leading coefficient of the numerator is 2 and the leading coefficient of the denominator is 1 which is the same thing as 2, so that's another way that we could have gotten our horizontal asymptote here. Example 4 says identify any asymptotes of the rational function r of x equals 7x squared minus 11x plus 1 all over 2x squared plus 3x minus 2. So in both our numerator and denominator we have quadratic functions because the degree, the highest power is 2, in both the numerator and the denominator. So that means that we have case 3 here, and our horizontal asymptote is going to be the leading coefficient of the numerator divided by the leading coefficient of the denominator. So the horizontal asymptote in this case is y equals 7 over 2, which is the same thing as 3.5. Either way, this gives us the horizontal asymptote. Now, for the vertical asymptotes, we need to set our denominator equal to 0.
So we have 2x squared plus 3x minus 2 is equal to 0. And this is a quadratic, so we could rely on the quadratic formula. I'm going to try to factor this using the x method. So in the top, I'm going to put my b value, which in this case is 3. And on the bottom, I'm going to put a times c, which is negative 4. And I want to find two numbers that add to b and multiply to a times c. The two numbers that I think that are going to accomplish that for me are 4 and negative 1. So what I can do is I can rewrite my quadratic as 2x squared plus 4x plus negative 1x minus 2 is equal to 0. Now because there are four terms, I can rely on factoring by grouping. So in the first grouping, I can factor out the greatest common factor of 2x, and that is going to leave us with x plus 2. And in the second grouping or second set of parentheses, we can factor out a negative 1, and that is also going to leave us with an x plus 2. So that's a clue or a hint that we are doing factoring by grouping correctly because the thing inside of the parentheses should be the same expression. If it's not, you may not be able to depend on factoring by grouping and you might just have to use something else. So from these, if I factor out an x plus 2, I will be left with 2x minus 1. This is equal to 0. From here we can use the zero product principle. So I'm going to go ahead and set each of these factors equal to zero and solve and we get x equals negative two and x equals one half. So now coming over here we have two vertical asymptotes. One of them is x equals negative two and the other one is at x equals one half. So these are our vertical asymptotes, as well as our horizontal asymptote. So the general steps for graphing a rational function are to 1. Factor the numerator and denominator if possible. 2. We then want to find any intercepts. That includes both x and y intercepts. 3. Find any asymptotes. And then 4. Put all of that information together to compose a graph. Example 5 wants us to graph this rational function. So let's start with step 1 by factoring both the numerator and the denominator. So I've gone ahead and I've factored my denominator. Now I want to try and factor my numerator. It's not clear to me what that factors into, so let's try using the quadratic formula. And from there we might be able to factor it. So I'm taking my numerator and I am setting it equal to 0. Then using the quadratic formula, we find that x is equal to negative b plus or minus the square root of negative b squared minus 4 times a times c all over 2 times a. So remember that when we're using the quadratic formula, the thing underneath the square root, which in general is called the radicand, but in the case of the quadratic formula, this thing here is called the discriminant. In this particular example, our discriminant ends up being a negative number, which tells us that there are not going to be any x-intercepts on our graph because our zeros of this function are imaginary. So they're not going to show up on the xy plane. So that also means that we're not going to be able to factor our numerator using real numbers. We could factor it using complex numbers, but I'm just going to go ahead and leave my numerator as is. So now that we have this information, we can move on to step two, which says find any intercepts. Because our numerator is not factorable and we use the quadratic formulas here, we know that, or we can conclude that there are no x-intercepts, but we can still check to see if there is a y-intercept. 
And the way that we would find a y-intercept is by plugging 0 into our function and seeing what our output value is. So let's do that. So off to the side here, I'm going to evaluate r of 0. In the numerator, the first two terms would disappear since we have 0 minus 0. And then we're basically just going to be left with 5 in the numerator. And then these two terms will disappear since they have an x and we'll just be left with the constant term. So this is equal to 5. So for x-intercepts, we did those earlier. There are none. And then for our y-intercept, remember, intercepts are always ordered pairs. So we have the ordered pair 0, 5 for our y-intercept. Now let's move on to step 3, which tells us to identify any asymptotes. Let's start off with the horizontal asymptote. Notice that my numerator is a quadratic function. My denominator is also a quadratic function since in both the numerator and denominator, our highest exponent is 2, which tells us we have the case where our degree of the numerator and the denominator are equal. So our horizontal asymptote is going to be the ratio of the leading coefficients. So the leading coefficient of my numerator is 2 and the leading coefficient of my denominator is 1, and those are located here and here. Even though there's not a 1 written there, it's implied that there is a 1 there. And if we divide 2 by 1, that just gives us 2. So we have our horizontal asymptote, which is the line y equals 2. For our vertical asymptote, we're going to take our denominator and set it equal to 0. If I take the square root of both sides, we would get x minus 1 equals the square root of 0 is just 0. And then if I added 1 to both sides, we get x equals 1. So here is our vertical asymptote, and it is the line x equals 1. I'm going to go ahead and start putting this together for step 4 so that we can create our graph. My vertical asymptote is here at y equals 1. My horizontal asymptote is here at y equals 2. Earlier I mistakenly said that the vertical asymptote was located at y equals 1. That was a mistake. It's supposed to be x equals 1. And then our horizontal asymptote is located at y equals 2. So I just wanted to set the record straight and there are no x-intercepts, and our y-intercept is located at 0, 0,5, which is right there. And now, let's just erase my y-intercept really quickly. Because my vertical asymptote is at x equals 1, that means that my graph can kind of go one of two ways to the left of the vertical asymptote. And it's either going to potentially look like this, or it's going to potentially look like this. Because when we have rational functions, our function graph needs to hug the asymptotes. Because that's kind of what asymptotes are. Our function graphs tend to get really close to them. And so we can't have both of these be the scenario because otherwise it would not pass the vertical line test and it would not be a function. However, in this case, I know that my graph has to be the portion that's above the horizontal asymptote because we found that our graph has no x-intercepts. So I can't have this down here, this graph down here, because it cannot cross the x-axis. So let me go ahead and erase this. And I'll put my y-intercept back, which was at 0, 0,5. So my graph is going to look something like this. And similarly, in or on the right side of our vertical asymptote, my graph could potentially look something like this or something like this. And again, we know that there are no x-intercepts, so I'm going to erase the bottom portion, and my graph is going to look something like that, where 
uh, our graph is above the horizontal asymptote. I went ahead and labeled our y-intercept, and that concludes this example. So we have the graph of this function. Example 6 says graph the function r of x equals 3x squared minus 6x all over x minus 2. So I'm going to go ahead and follow step 1 from our previous guide by factoring our numerator and denominator. In my numerator, I can factor out a 3x from both of these terms, and I would be left with x minus 2. And my denominator is already factored, and so we have x minus 2. Now, what's going to happen is that just like with numbers, if I had something like 12 over 3, I could rewrite this as, or factor the numerator, and I could rewrite that as 3 times 4 over 3, and I could divide the 3's out, and so this is equal to 4. So similarly, I can divide the x minus 2, and I'm going to be left with 3x. Now, something to keep in mind is that we have a function here. So right now we're claiming that r of x, which was originally equal to 3x squared minus 6x over x minus 2, is equal to 3x. And as it stands, these two functions are actually not equal to each other because in order for two functions to be equal to each other or to be the same function, they have to have the same domain and the same range, the exact same domain and the exact same range. So right now, this function on the right has a domain of all real numbers. And this function here has a domain of all real numbers except for 2 because of our denominator. So in order for these two functions to be the same function, I have to restrict the domain of the one on the right of 3x. So one way that I could do that is on the right-hand side here, I could just put a semicolon and say x cannot equal 2, or we could just make a little asterisk and say that our domain would need to be negative infinity to 2, union 2 to infinity. Either of these work, but we just need to acknowledge that in order for these to be the same function, they have to have the same domain, which if we restrict the domain on the right side, now they have the same domain and range. That means that even though this is a rational function, uh, really the graph of this is formed by graphing a linear function y equals 3x, just where x cannot equal Two. So how does that look like? Well, let's just start off by graphing y equals 3x. We know that when we're graphing a linear function y equals mx plus b, we can figure out what the y-intercept is from the b value. Here our b value is 0, which tells us that our y-intercept is going to be the point 0 comma 0. And we have a slope of 3, so that means that I have a rise of 3, I'm going to go up three units and then over one unit. And so that's going to end me right here. And then I could do that again to figure out where I'm going next. I could go up three units and over one. And same thing from the origin. I could also go down three units, left one unit. That would end me here. Now, our domain is all real numbers except for x equals 2. So what, how that translates is on our graph, we're actually going to have an open circle when x equals 2. And everything else is going to be connected via this linear graph here. So here, there is a hole at... 2 comma 6. So this is the linear function y equals 3x, except we are including, or excuse me, excluding x equals 2. So there's a hole at the ordered pair 2 comma 6. So 
holes occur when, let's consider a rational function r of x equals f of x over g of x. If x minus a is a linear factor of both f of x and g of x, then there is a hole at x equals a in the graph of r of x. So in this example, we saw that our numerator and denominator both shared the linear factor x minus 2. So that tells us that there is a hole when x is equal to 2. So far we've talked about vertical asymptotes and horizontal asymptotes. It turns out that there's another kind of asymptote called a slant asymptote. Slant asymptotes occur when the degree of the numerator is exactly one higher than the degree of the denominator. They are of the form y equals mx plus b and can be found using long division. Example 7 says, let r of x equal x squared plus 5x plus 4 all over x minus 3. Find any asymptotes, then sketch a graph of r of x. Let's start off by finding the slant asymptote. We're going to use long division. So we have x minus 3. We want to divide that into x squared plus 5x plus 4. So I'm going to ask myself, how many times does x go into x squared? And that's x. So x times x is x squared, and then negative 3 times x is negative 3x. I'm going to subtract 5x minus negative 3x is 8x, and then I can bring down the 4. Now I want to ask myself, how many times does x go into 8x? And that is positive 8. And then 8 times negative 3 is negative 24. From here, 4 minus negative 24 is positive 28. I know to stop here because the remainder that I'm looking at, which is 28, has a degree that is smaller than our original divisor. So 28 is a constant. That means its degree is 0, and the degree of our divisor was 1. Also, I forgot to mention earlier that our numerator is a quadratic function and our denominator is a linear function, which means that the degree of the numerator is exactly one higher than the degree of the denominator, so that tells us that we are going to have a slant asymptote. And again, we find it by using long division. So I'm going to now rewrite our original function from the division algorithm. We know that x squared plus 5x plus 4 over x minus 3 can be rewritten as x plus 8 and then plus 28 over x minus 3. So I'm going to go ahead and clean this up. So if we were to think about the end behavior of this as x goes to infinity, what's going to happen is this fraction here is going to go off to 0 because the numerator is a constant and the denominator is getting infinitely large, so the fraction as a whole is getting infinitely small, which means that basically what's left over is this linear function here. So as x goes to infinity, r of x goes to x plus 8. And it seems weird because in all the other instances when we've had uh, end behavior, our end behavior or our y value has always kind of trended towards some numerical value or infinity or negative infinity. So this actually does go off to infinity, but it sticks close to this linear function here, x plus 8. So I'm just going to really quickly sketch. Let's say, uh, let's say there's 8 and it has a slope of 1. So our slant asymptote is going to look something like this. And let's go ahead and write that over here. I'm going to write slant asymptote is y equals x plus 8. Let's go ahead and find our vertical asymptote now, if there is one. So I'm going to take my denominator, and I'm going to set that equal to 0, and then solve for x, and we get x equals 3. So my vertical asymptote is the line x equals 3. And I'm going to go ahead and plot that now. So let's say 3, x equals 3 is about here. And then 
Let's go ahead and factor the numerator now. I have x squared plus 5x plus 4. This is going to factor into x plus 4 times x plus 1. And if we set that equal to 0 and use the zero product principle, we would get x equals negative 4 and x equals negative 1. That tells me where our x-intercepts are going to be. One of them is at negative 4, 0, and one of them is at negative 1, 0. Let's go ahead and try to find our y-intercept now. I'm going to plug in 0 into my function, and then my numerator is going to be 4, and my denominator is going to be negative 3. So this will be negative 4 thirds. Let's go ahead and plot that. That's going to be about there. So because our graph is hugging our asymptotes and has to go through these ordered pairs, it's going to look something like this. And then there are no other x-intercepts, so it could not look like this, because that means that it would have to cross our x-axis. So that means that the other portion of our graph would look something like that, and it's going to hug here, and it's going to hug our asymptotes. So again, the end behavior, notice that as x goes to infinity, r of x also goes to infinity. However, it also kind of closely approaches the linear function or the line y equals x plus 8. So that's a visualization of our slant asymptote that we have here. Example 8 asks us to find the slant asymptote and the vertical asymptote of this rational function, and the numerator is a cubic, and the denominator is a quadratic, so the numerator has a degree that is exactly one higher, so that tells us that there will be a slant asymptote. So I'm going to take my denominator, I'm going to see how that goes into our numerator. Okay, so if I wanted to figure out negative 3x squared times some value is equal to negative 5x cubed, if I wanted to figure out what the question mark was, I could use algebra and divide both sides by negative 3 squared, excuse me, negative 3x squared. And so we would get question mark equals negative 5 divided by negative 3 is just 5 thirds and then x cubed divided by x squared is just x. So here I'm going to put 5 thirds x. All right, I jumped ahead a little bit, so now we want to subtract negative 3x squared minus negative 5 thirds x squared. That will give us negative 4 thirds x squared. Negative 2x minus 5x, that will give us minus 7x. And then I can bring down this minus 1. So now I want to figure out what do I multiply to negative 3x squared that will give me negative 4 thirds x squared. So again, if I were to divide both sides by negative 3x squared, on the left hand side we'd be left with question mark equals and on the right hand side x squared divided by x squared is 1 so we are doing negative 4 thirds divided by negative 3 which is the same thing as multiplying by the reciprocal so uh, negative times a negative is a positive and this is going to become 4 ninths so up here I have 4 ninths And then this will be minus 4 ninths x, and then this will be plus 4 thirds. And after subtracting, this is 0, negative 4 thirds x squared minus negative 4 thirds x squared is 0, and we have minus 59 
over 9x, and then minus 7 thirds. If it seems like I did that kind of quickly, I did this already, so if it takes you a little bit longer to work with the fractions, don't fret. I'm also just going to drop the zero, so this thing here represents our remainder. And the remainder is actually something we can kind of ignore when we're solving for the slant asymptote because in terms of the slant asymptote, the thing that we really care about is what is on top of the division bar. So coming over here, our slant asymptote is the linear equation y equals 5 thirds x plus 4 ninths. So there is our slant asymptote. So now we want to find vertical asymptotes by taking our denominator and setting it equal to zero. I'm going to use the quadratic formula. So we have negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4 times a times c all over 2 times a. So from here, I can rewrite this as 1 plus or minus the square root. If you simplify the discriminant, that's going to end up being 37. And in our denominator, we have negative 6. So our vertical asymptotes, we have two of them. One of them is at x equals 1 plus the square root of 37 over negative 6, and the other one is located at 1 minus the square root of 37 over negative 6. And these are our two vertical asymptotes. And this concludes this section on rational functions. Thanks for watching.